Welcome everyone. My name is Erin White and I'm the Global Outreach Director for Bethel. And today we have one of our global partners with us. And normally we'd start off by having them introduce themselves and where exactly it is that they practice ministry. But today, just due to some precautions, we are just going to refer to our visitor today as Paul and refer to the region he works as South Asia. So welcome. Thank you so much for being with us today. We're excited to have you. Thank you, Erin. It's so good to be here at Bethel and just to be able to talk to you all uh, in this way. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. Well, to start out, uh, could you share with us a little bit about what has God been doing in your ministry over the last year or so? Yeah, it's amazing to see the power of the gospel, not only saving lives, but changing lives. And as Christ said, that he will build his church. And so it's been a great joy to see not only people being being saved, uh, especially in our part of the world, where there is, particularly in our cities, a million people a mile. It's a lot of souls. That's a lot. (laughs) Uh, It's a hub of many different religions. It's spiritually very dark. And uh, many, many uh, people groups still to be reached. And yet, as the Lord promised, And as we share his good news, uh, it's been wonderful to see the Lord save and build uh, his church. And so the latest is we have been training church planters. uh, And now we are at uh, planting four churches within our city and four in unreached people groups, but one particularly out of our own home. And it's been a great joy to see uh, uh, a church Uh, being built, and we had our first baptism, about uh, 13 of them getting baptized, and so it's been a great joy to see the fruit of the the gospel and and seeing the church being built up, yeah. That's quite the the season recently. So Mm -hmm. what are some ways that you would say that you're seeing the kingdom growing where you're working in South Asia? Yeah. So in our part of the world, as I said, it's uh, it's so many people lost, but so many people are poor as well. And so the Lord has allowed us uh, through the organization that we partner, uh, be able to reach out to the community um, through education and health. Me being a medical doctor, just a great opportunity to serve people in a very tangible, you know, caring their physical health, but also helping them through education, you know. And so we have a child health education program where we have identified certain communities that we've been working for more than 15 years. And to be able to see these children, uh, not only educated, going to school, and graduating uh, from school and then college. Uh, and remember, they are some of the uh, first generation to do so. Uh, for example, uh, one one brother, I want to just call him Brother K, mm-hmm. and uh, he came to our city, uh, this capital city, as a child labor. And then through our nonprofit, we were able to introduce him to school, get him admitted in school. He graduated from school and college. And then we uh, we saw the Lord save him. And then as church leaders, as church, we invited him in our church planners training and today, he is not only a church leader, uh, but he is preaching while I'm gone. Yeah. And then he's planting a church in one other community. So it's uh, just amazing to see growing leaders uh, and therefore the growing ministry and seeing churches being planted. It's a growing kingdom. And through it all, uh, seeing the glory of God and his gospel shine forth in very, very dark part of the world. Certainly. Yeah, a lot of growth going on. Something I have seen you do especially well is developing new leaders, kind of like Mm -hmm. you were just talking about. Brother K was one of those examples. Mm -hmm. So what are some other successes that you have seen in addition to Brother K in developing young leaders who are now becoming uh, pastors and church planners and fulfilling Mm -hmm. other leadership roles? What are some of those success stories you've seen in addition to that? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so it's been a long journey, about 15 years. As I said, we begin with this uh, boys and girls who are little, you know, in our uh, community education program. But as they grow, it's as they grow, hear the gospel, come to know the Lord. And so it's an army 
of leaders being raised over all these years, uh, you know, equipping them in the word, you know, helping them to grasp the beauty and the brilliance of our Lord Jesus Christ and the glory of it. And so, and so as they grow personally, we see, we've seen their family coming slowly, slowly to know the Lord. And then their community where we're, where they're planting churches as well. Uh, for example, another brother, M, he came to us as a child to go to school and in tutoring. Of course, hearing the gospel, he got saved. He invited his brother. He got saved. And as brothers, they are missing on Sundays from their home because they're coming to church. So yeah. their mom said, oh, where do you go on Sunday? <laughs> and so this is mom, come and see. And so she started to come. And then she came to know the Lord mm. and the Lord saved her. But that's not it. Uh, lastly, as you know, at the end, the dad, you, can, you have to drag him in, right? <laughs> but it's the Lord who saved him. He was alcohol addicted. And now not only he's sober, he's saved, but he's actually having a vision to reach out to other fathers wow. uh, who are struggling with this. And so this brother M is now not only his family saved, uh, but M is one of, those, one of the brothers who is planting another church and in that community, he is now building into teenagers and raising other young leaders like wow. him. And you know, so it's it's multiplication, disciples making disciples, yeah. and multiplying these young leaders uh, to be able to grow and go and and multiply. And so one part of our work is definitely the nonprofit, but even some of the for-profit outreach that the Lord has allowed us are led by these children or, you know, who were young with us when they started. And now they're leaders, they're, you know, the church leaders, and they love the Lord, love the church, and use whether business or for-profit or non-profit means to reach out to the community. So a whole group of, you know, church planters and leaders being raised, being sent out, because we also want to reach the unreached people groups as well in our country. So it sounds like some of it is just natural as you've had mm -hmm. these young leaders come to know Christ, mm -hmm. and then they've had these opportunities to share with with their family, mm -hmm. and then that causes a natural like, multiplication, right? Yeah. But then you also have the like intentional yes. training that you provide as well. Um, can you share a yeah. little bit about like your you call it like, church planter training, right? Yes. Um, yeah. Can you share a little bit about that process and how that helps provide the mm -hmm. equipping as well to the kind of natural multiplication that happens? Yeah. So that is that is something that the Lord, you know, uh, just opened and allowed us to see like, wow, if we are growing, communities are being reached, uh, even through a nonprofit and people are getting saved and churches are being planned, we need to raise leaders. Uh, and so, of course, in the church, discipleship process goes on and they keep growing, but we have to be very intentional and being very specific in identifying and even inviting some of them. Uh, just like Christ, as he discipled, he invited them, you know, identified them, he invested in them, you know, throughout the discipleship process. In the same way that we invite them, uh, we identify, invite them, and then invest in them. And, and we really invest in them on a weekly basis and in the context of the church. So they're really serving in the church. They're coming alongside me and how do we prepare a sermon? They're going to children's ministry and seeing how they plan the lessons. What do they teach and why do they teach? And in that way, they're exposed to really church life. And at the same time, they're getting a intense, uh, you know, Bible training as well, yeah. like an institute where they are getting Bible classes, Bible survey, Old Testament, New Testament survey, and all the systematic theology. And yet, at the same time, they're actually also going out. So trainings are in the morning. In the afternoon, they go out to their own communities and church planting areas. Mm. So they're coming back the other next day and saying, this is the, some challenges we're facing. I share the gospel in this way. And she asked this question, what do I do? So it's an ongoing in-ministry, church-based leadership development training. They're very intentional 
towards church planting. That's why we're calling it church planters training. And that involves not only the future pastors, but also other leaders, women leaders. We have so many women in the community that do British, uh, children leaders. Some are who are into nonprofit kind of you know, outreach to the church planning, the end goal of church planning. We have some for-profit kind of, if there are some avenues we can uh, build a bridge in the community that we can reach out. So in that way, it's very intentional. It's very prayerful. It's a church-based and it is a joy. It is a joy to see them grow and multiply. And because some of them are, you know, they're now preaching in my absence right now. Uh, they're preaching, they are teaching, they're discipling, they're multiplying. And as I, I was sharing that we do partner with some of the unreached people groups, uh, the people that are on the ground that we partner, we also bring them up to us and train them. But then our church planners, the leaders, are actually connecting with them on a weekly basis, even as this unreached people group, uh, church planners are right there in the remote areas. So in, they, in this way, we are keeping connected and we continue to you know, uh, grow in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and how we can live it out in our day-to-day -day life. So it's a very yeah. intentional church planters training and yes. it's a great joy. <laughs> and it's expanding now. Many other pastors are now requesting, can we send? Because it originally oh, wow. came out as our own church only, mm -hmm. own church ground up kind of thing. And now other churches are requesting, uh, you know, saying, can we send our young people so that they can grow in that context uh, of the church setting? and yet would benefit other churches as well as they reach out to their own communities. So it's yeah. a beautiful thing that the Lord has done. That's wonderful. I know some of us were able to go and visit you a few years back now um, mm -hmm. prior to COVID, and we were able to see testament of that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was talking with you the other day about how mm -hmm. some of those um, young people that I met that mm -hmm. our team kind of worked alongside and that they were still being trained. Now you come back and I get to hear updates and now mm -hmm. they are leading churches and church planting and being leaders in ministry. So I've yeah. been able to see it like in a sense through you and firsthand by meeting some of them, mm -hmm. how this um, focus on leadership development is playing out. And it's very exciting to see yeah. and wonderful what a wonderful example i think too for us to see pouring mm -hmm. into young people and developing them in mm -hmm. a way that now they're able to help grow the kingdom mm -hmm. yes so these are well. some wonderful things that are going on and we love mm. to hear that but we know just like how we had to share for some precaution sake of why we're using a different name and saying where you are that there are there are challenges that mm -hmm. you face as well mm -hmm. uh, so would you be able to share a little bit about what are some challenges that you and, and your ministry faces in particular and ministering in your region yeah thank you yes so as i said our the country that we live in is a hub of many of the prominent uh, philosophy and religion in this world. And uh, it's just Romans 1, a lot of creation being worshipped instead of the creator. And so now you're thinking about anything and everything can be worshipped. So that itself is very dark. Uh, but then it's a growing movement of wanting that particular religion to be the main uh, religion of the country. And so, therefore, it's now coming from the political side of things, the challenges, to impose on certain laws that will not allow conversion, uh, to be more specific, forceful conversion, but they can always label it to anyone who is trying to share the gospel and see them get saved and baptized. Baptism becomes the key one. Uh, uh, well, people say, oh, this is now you're converting someone. So the challenge is coming from the government point of view as well and from the people's movement as well. The religious movement itself, you know, certain religious groups are very, very, very forceful about it. And so those challenges are coming in, but it's amazing to see through those challenges and persecution is when the church grows even more. And it, it's purged as well uh, because now people are standing in line for, uh, you know, for the gospel, no matter whatever suffering that they go through. For example, the story of Brother K, as I said, who was a child labor, now is a church leader. Uh, he got married to Sister S and, and she was one of those little girls in one of our tutoring programs for a nonprofit. And she eventually grew up, uh, heard the gospel, got saved, became a teacher, and then she was coordinating, leading one of those small children's programs. Uh, 
And so the family was okay in a sense, like she was doing something, she was growing education-wise and all of that. But where the rubber meets the road is her marriage. In our part of the world, we do arranged marriage. The mm -hmm. parents tell you, and here in this case, the non-Christian parents say, okay, you got to marry this one from this particular background, religious background. And she's too strong. And she, uh, it was not just one, two months. It was more than a year that she was literally locked up, not allowed to go wow. and disconnect from the church and the nonprofit. Just the pressure upon pressure for her to marry someone the family would really kind of force upon her to marry an unbeliever. She's too strong, but in God's amazing sovereign way, uh, found out that she and and Brother K, uh, who is a teacher as a leader now, that they like each other. <laughs> and we say it's God arranged. And so finally, uh, they did get married and now they're planting a church. So even though it was crisis, uh, suffering and persecution, they're standing against whole world turned upside down, literally. And yet uh, she stood strong. And now we see how the Lord is using them. So even those persecution problems. Another story of Brother uh, P. Mm -hmm. still, uh, uh, he came to know the Lord from the campus outreach. And then he came as a volunteer, heard the gospel, got saved. And I still remember the day when he walked into my office with tears and said, uh, bro, I just lost my family. I said, what happened? Well, I was on the phone telling my mom that I finally, you know, I, I want to follow Jesus. He's the one, only one who died for my sins and was buried and rose again. I want to be a disciple of Christ. And mom was so upset, said, don't call me mom anymore. You're bringing shame to my family and community and our culture and our country. Uh, you know, don't call me mom anymore and return to me all the money I ever spent on you since your birth. Wow. And that was it for years. If if I'm not wrong, I think it was more than five years that he just couldn't get back to her until lately she, he did and shared the gospel and gave her a, a Bible. But this particular brother, uh, P, is now just recently ordained as an elder. On yeah. the church. And so he has grown even more stronger in his stand with the Lord, even though it was such a sacrifice, the cost of her of his own family, and, and just an unashamed of the gospel sharing. So even though there was suffering and sacrifice and persecution, and yet we've seen him grow even more stronger. And now that he's an elder and he leads the nonprofit, he's, he's even multiplying that. And so guess what? When most of the people in our, in our work there are coming from a non-Christian background, when they come to know the Lord, Brother B, uh, brother P can tell, okay, let me tell you what's coming yeah. and how through prayer and perseverance and completely trusting, surrendering to Christ, mm -hmm. our Lord, who is the one who saves us, sustains us and grows us and uses us. And so it's a beautiful story of seeing one life of the other through suffering and persecution, still trusting the Lord, uh, brings out a beautiful a display of God's glory through his gospel. So we're yeah. privileged to see that. Wow. So such great stories and examples um, from the people that you work with. So you've kind of shared a little bit about like what some of them have faced, such as um, you know losing family or losing relationships with their family mm -hmm. by going to follow Christ mm -hmm. because of the religion their family practices. Mm -hmm. And you shared a little bit about some of the like anti-conversion laws that yeah. you face in regions of the country mm -hmm. as well. So with, along with that, would you say those are some of the key challenges or are there any other challenges you would say that Jesus followers in general in your region um, are, are facing and that, uh, that they're dealing with right now? Yeah, as I said, it is uh, a very systematic mm -hmm. approach of this particular philosophy in our, in our part of the country imposing that particular religion. So whether it's education, the schools, to laws being instituted, to community that are growing stronger at a community level, uh, hindering the work of the, of the gospel. Uh, so that kind of challenge is spreading throughout the country. And so in a way, this is affecting the whole uh, part of our world. Uh, but adding to that, also family uh, persecution and challenges as well. And so family is coming more stronger and says, see, 
this is, you know, this is bringing, it's a shame culture. So it brings yeah. shame to the family. So we're seeing a growing challenge in that persecution side of things. But at the same time, we're seeing the gospel being proclaimed and we're seeing genuine, true, born again believers being baptized, no matter what the cost. Uh, so that is one challenge. But also the, some other challenges we're seeing among the followers of Christ in our part of the world is also sadly some of the prosperity gospel. Yeah. And so I think that is that is coming from kind of so-called within. And that also confuses the people. And that could be one of the challenges that will only, you know, be you know, be faced uh, through continual growing in the word, seeking the truth, preaching the gospel right, and and the churches that are strong. And so that comes back to our training, becomes such a key, not only within the church, but also one of the trainings that we have is pastor's training, pastor seminars, workshop that we're trying to help other churches around. About 150 comes uh, in our networks. It's amazing to see the hunger for the truth and that builds them and keeps them strong in the word and seeing genuine believers who are really repenting of their sin and receiving Jesus as their only Lord and Savior. So those are some challenges from outside, from society, from family, but also even from within the so-called church. Mm -hmm. And yet through it all, uh, we're seeing the Lord, you know, as he promised, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Yeah. And we are just witnessing that, watching the power of the gospel mm -hmm. and just uh, the privilege that we have in, in our part of the world. And mm -hmm. so thankful for your partnership here in Bethel. Yeah. With the prosperity gospel idea, would you say um, is a lot of the influence more on the like financial aspect of prosperity gospel? Because I feel like there's also um, there's talk and understanding these days seemingly of how the prosperity gospel has infiltrated in multiple ways of our thinking mm -hmm. in just the essential. If I follow Christ, that means I will gain a good life or mm -hmm. that automatically means that um, things are going to go smoothly for me. Yeah. Would you say there's um, a mixture of all those things or is it more of the, there's also that financial aspect too, that mm -hmm. especially if you have um, pastors and others who yeah. are watching the mm -hmm. like well-known people on, mm -hmm. on YouTube or other things mm -hmm. on internet, a lot of that sometimes gets mixed in with the financial aspect. Um, so what are some of those ways that you're kind of seeing that prosperity gospel message play out? Yeah, you're right, Aaron. You brought out all of those are valid. Uh, but it, bottom line, I mean, the main point is really it's so self-focused. Mm. And we are the same people all around the world. And that's why gospel is relevant for all people everywhere, whether rich or poor, and educated, uneducated. So when it is really focused on me, and it's all about me, whether getting wealthy or staying prosperous or getting healthy, you know, and the Lord is the one who can heal. The Lord is the one who can prosper. But if it's all about me, and that's what the prosperity preachers kind of take advantage of to get uh, the appeal, to get the you know, to get popular. Yeah. And in our part of the world, that draws a lot of people, and so you'll see crowd and lots of people, which also adds to the whole you know whole challenge of persecution. Mm -hmm. Because then the others are watching like, oh, so many people are so-called becoming Christians. Uh, but then the problem is very soon, as the Lord said, suffering will follow. There's a cost to be a disciple of Christ. And that's where the sad part is. Uh, it also even hindered the gospel because some of the stories would be, oh, this so-and-so became Christian. And then this didn't happen. The healing didn't happen or this you know, prosperity didn't come. And so they left. So it's so temporal, it's focused on human being yeah. instead of God-focused, eternal life-focused mm -hmm. and how Christ is worth our life, whether we suffer or not. One of the examples I was sharing with you, that even as our work is among the slum community, it's, it's wonderful to watch that people who are poor coming to the Lord, and even though they may still be poor, and in, in, in the commu Islam community, the peace that they can have, they have, nothing can take it away. That's just powerful. What Jesus said, I will give the peace, not like the peace the world gives. And so uh, if you have peace in the midst of poverty, if you have peace in the midst of storm, crisis, 
that peace is what we're talking about our Lord Jesus Christ gives. This is not worldly peace that comes through material or even good health. And so that's powerful you know, to watch when people uh, are genuinely coming to know the Lord as a pastor. That's our biggest challenge is to see a lot of people. They say they're Christians, but the moment there's a struggle, a problem, they are gone. Whether it's COVID was one point. Uh, and so it, it's, it's, you know, it's so important that the true gospel and the word being preached, uh, even as Paul said in, in Galatians, that even if an angel come from heaven and share a different gospel, this is no gospel. And so I think, and it's anathema, it's a very severe warning. And so that has also been very relevant for us, our church and our part of the world, that uh, we need to be very, very careful. Uh, but that also comes with a great joy of seeing uh, Jesus being lifted, being the, uh, being the center point of the lives. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, um, thinking of the, the unique, um, I guess, aspects of ministering in different parts of the world, mm-hmm. something we were talking about um, earlier was, I think something that's interesting when people start to get involved with some global ministry and global work is they'll see uh, the different cultural aspects that come into play when mm-hmm. it comes to ministering. Mm-hmm. So like in, in your culture and the primary religion that people are part of there, we were talking earlier about how it's in some places it's introducing Jesus and like that's the primary it's more easy like this is your god right mm. but in with the primary religion you have it's easy to be like sure he sounds great i'll add him <laughs> to the other gods i already worship or idolize and so what is some of that like of bringing in not just introducing jesus as another god mm. but rather differentiating no not only is is Jesus a God? Jesus is the God. Mm. And this means you replace the other gods and now you worship one true God. What is that kind of like mm. in facing with that specific aspect, aspect that you yeah. have in your culture and with the primary religion there? Oh, well, Aaron, you really hit the bullseye <laughs> because one advantage in our part of the world is they are pantheistic, so mm. they are open to talk about God and you can pray and all of that. That's not a problem. But when you come to say that Jesus is the only way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Mm-hmm. That is where the challenge comes. They, in a, in a typical uh, you know, public transportation or you know, a small vehicle that takes you, you know, tra- public transportation, you'll see different gods and they will add Jesus mm-hmm. as one of the gurus. So that is very, very prevalent. And as I said, it's worshiping of the creation more than the creator. And so looking at all kinds of animals being worshipped or creation. And so that is where the challenge comes is to communicate clearly and boldly the distinction between the creator and creation. Mm. Uh, that knowing Christ is not uh, you know, changing one religion to the other. It is from being spiritually dead, Ephesians 2, to being made spiritually alive. And that's a huge transformation. Uh, that is transferring from the kingdom of darkness to light. And so communicating those truths with, of course, the preaching of the word as, you know, faith comes by hearing of the word, the word of Christ in Romans 10. And then, and, uh, you know, and, and the power of the Holy Spirit, you know, being convicting them, in, you know, regenerating them. And that's beautiful to watch because then at the end of the day, this is not our work. We share Christ and we see how God alone saves people out of those darkness, out of those worshiping creation to the one and only true creator who became the Lamb of God, who is the only one who died. So this is the cross of Christ is so powerful for us because in all of those different gurus and gods, so-called they have, they have not done nothing to save us. It's only Christ who have done everything, the sacrifice, atonement for our sins. So it's not a good work-based religion. It is the work of Christ. It is don't do something to get something, but it's done. It is done yeah. in Christ. And so that's beautiful uh, and powerful when people are able to see that. You could see their eyes literally scaling off. The you know mm. the, the you know the the screen goes off, and they can see Christ, which has happened in my life as well. Wow. When 
the work of the Holy Spirit, the gospel, uh, be able to understand, you know, just be able to like, wow, that's why Christ alone, mm -hmm. no one else in all of this world have sacrificed for our sin, the perfect, perfect life, perfect sacrifice, and he alone, as we trust him, can save us. So that becomes the greatest challenge, as you said, mm -hmm. but also greatest um, joy to see when Christ saves people, yeah. the power of the gospel in that way. Wonderful. <laughs> Uh, so now we want to think of like looking towards the future. What are some mm -hmm. things that you and those others that you're working with are looking forward to now, whether it be with, with your family, with your church, mm -hmm. with your ministry, uh, and just all the work that you guys are doing in reaching the lost in that region? Yeah, looking forward, very exciting again from what the Lord has already done that we want to look forward. By the way, just to share with you that I belong to that country, but my wife is from your country. Yes. <laughs> and she moved to my part of the world almost 19 years ago. Wow. Uh, as a single. Mm -hmm. And the Lord brought us together. <laughs> you know, the arranged marriage by God. <laughs> and we have two teenagers, and both of them love the Lord. They were recently baptized along with the 11 that were baptized in our, our new church plant. And um, I have a toddler. He's yeah. just two, so <laughs> prayers are needed for all the emotions <laughs> and the energy that goes in a home with, you know, with uh, the teenagers and the toddler. Yeah. But as for me and my house, as a family, we will serve the Lord, and that's that's literally practically on mm -hmm. Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of us get on our feet and get ready. So as a as a family, we're serving, but more key, serving ministry is all about people investing in life, showing the love of Christ. And so going forward, we are hoping to continue to train and equip and, and leaders and church planners and send them out and multiply. And also look at avenues, whether it's nonprofit way of health and education or even for-profit businesses. So this is exciting going forward because now we're living in, in a time where God can use different careers, different ways. Whatever the Lord is using you right here locally can be used globally. It's a global world now. And so we're seeing how God is using our business, our nonprofit ways to going forward, more specifically, what we are looking forward and we're praying is for a particular building of our own. We've been almost 20 years now. We were just out of a small basement that is rented and any day we can lose it within a month's notice and all of that. So for the stability, even of our future leaders that have been raised and the ability to multiply, we're praying and, and we are looking, launching this building project, which is really be a hub, a training center, a ministry center, a church, so we can continue to multiply uh, and train and send out people and share the gospel mm -hmm. and see Christ building his church. And so more particularly, we're looking at that yeah. uh, building project mm -hmm. that will be a huge dream fulfilled for the future. Uh, we know it's Christ who does the work and we trust him, look up to him, mm -hmm. and we're praying for provision for that particular um, building project as mm -hmm. we are in a, in a city that's very expensive, it's growing. As I said, it's a million a mile, million people a mile. Mm -hmm. It's going to be one of the largest populated city in the world. Mm -hmm. And so it's an expensive uh, project, but I think it's, it's, uh, uh, it's worth as the Lord provides, looking into the future, particularly with the leadership being developed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, around here at Bethel with Global Outreach, so those of you who have been around are probably familiar with, we we commonly say, pray, give, go, serve, right? And those are the ways that you can get involved with Global Outreach. So um, for sure, be praying. We've heard lots of great things here today to be praying for, praying for for you and your family, as well as all those others who are, are being raised up and already church planting and everything, lots of people to be praying for. Um, and then with giving, now we know there's a specific need even with this building project. So if anyone around Bethel is interested in, in getting involved through giving towards that, you guys can reach out um, to at global at Bethel.ch and we can get you connected to be able to, to give if God so leads you to get involved in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and we've already been talking about going and trying mm -hmm. to look forward forward to the future and we're hoping to get some things calendared to be able to plan to get Bethel people back over to mm -hmm. get to be with you in person see the work you're doing firsthand we look forward to 
when that can come about again. And for those at Bethel, be on the lookout for in the future as we can get that um, scheduled and calendared. And we look forward to that. So um, is there any any last things that you'd love to to share with our people um, while you're able to be here here with us in person? Well, Erin, as you just said, you know, I want to extend my invitation. Please <laughs> come. Yes. A partnership is on the feet, on the ground mm-hmm. together. And whether you are a business person, mm-hmm. student, nursing, we have it all That's aspects of our work. Mm-hmm. And we'd love for you all to come and visit us and mm-hmm. so that we can serve together. Uh, but it's really all for the glory of God to see the gospel going forth and see his church being built and multiplied. And so I just want to say the last thing is really giving God all glory and honor alone. We are nothing. I am nothing. My wife, our organization is nothing. It's all about Christ who loves and saves and builds his body and his church, whether locally here for you Mm -hmm. and globally over there for us. So let's keep praying for one another, partnering one another, and let's uh, work hand in hand uh, over there. We are blessed by being able to partner with with organizations like yours to be able to be the hands and feet via the partnership and to be able to work together. And the other side of the partnership is us getting to hear from you and love Mm -hmm. these visits and these opportunities to learn from you. But that's also where hopefully we'll be able to bring some people in person to also get to learn even more from you and just share in that partnership relationship. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for being a partner with us. And we look forward to our future too. Thank you. (laughs) Wonderful to be here. God bless you all. Thank you.